Good afternoon. My name is William Serrat, and I serve as president of El Paso Community College, and it is my honor to moderate this session with two individuals uh, who play key roles throughout the state of Texas. Uh, first, we have Mr. Roberto Zarate, who serves as a trustee at Alamo Colleges. Uh, Roberto Zarate, Alamo College trustee, District 5, is a retired educator with more than 36 years experience. He served on the Co Alamo College's board for 13 years since he was appointed to the District 5 seat in August 2013. He was subsequently elected to the seat in May 2004 and was most recently re-elected in May 2012 and once again in May 2018. He was elected chair of the Alamo College's board from 2006 to 2008 and has also held positions as secretary, vice chair, chair of academic accountability and student success committee. He currently chairs the audit budget and finance committees as well. In October 2015, Mr. Zarate was sworn in as the, as the first Alamo College's trustee and the second Hispanic to chair the board of directors of the Association of Community College Trustees, ACCT. Uh, he was only the second trustee from Texas to be elected chair, and he was chosen as chair-elect by unanimous vote in 2014 and will have served a one-year term before becoming chair. Um, in addition, Mr. Zarate holds a master's degree from San Diego State University and a bachelor's degree from Howard Payne College in Brownwood, Texas. He and his wife, Jane Ann, are the parents of a daughter and three sons. Uh, we also have joining us Chancellor Brenda Hellyer. In 2009, Dr. Brenda Hellyer was appointed Chancellor of San Jacinto College. She began her involvement with the college in 1996 as the inaugural director of the San Jacinto College Foundation. She served in a number of executive positions at the college, including Executive Vice President for Resource Development, Vice Chancellor for Fiscal Affairs, Chief Financial Officer, and Executive Chancellor, Vice Chancellor before being appointed Chancellor. Prior to joining San Jacinto, Dr. Hellyer worked in the corporate world as an accountant in both the private and public arena. Her experience ranged from mom and pop businesses and Fortune 500 companies to governmental agencies and entrepreneurial ventures in East Harris County. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Fort Hayes State University in Hayes, Kansas, a master's degree in business administration from the University of Texas at Austin, and a doctorate degree in community college leadership from the University of Texas at Austin. She has received the Distinguished Graduate Award from the College of Education at the University of Texas at Austin in spring 2009, and she is also a certified public accountant licensed in Texas. Welcome to both of you, uh, Mr. Zarate and Chancellor Hellyer. Uh, I want to start today's discussion and really just uh, give you an opportunity to tell uh, the audience about yourself and about your institution. And Chancellor Hellyer, I'll begin with you, please. Thank you, William and Roberto. I'm honored to be on this panel with, with both of you. So um, San Jacinto College, we're located in Harris County, um, East Harris County, outside of Houston. We have five campuses, annually serve about 45,000 credit and non-credit students. We operate um, as multi-campus, but a one college district, and that has allowed us to do a lot of alignment across our college. And um, our focus is on student success. Our board is, um, it's a great board. It's a board that's really focused on, on the right things. And that's um, our students, our taxpayers and our community. And, and so I've been very honored to serve in, in this role. We are in the heart of petrochem, maritime, aerospace, the health, um, the health industries. And, and so we, we have a, a great um, workforce program that, that we, we use to really support our community. About 70% of our students are transfer students and about 30% are, are in the workforce programs. And about 45% of our students are first generation to college. And so um, I'm honored to be here. And like I said, I, I'm truly honored to be the Chancellor of San Jacinto College. It, it's never where I thought my career would go but it's a place where you can really see the impact you can make in your community. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Zarate, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Alamo Colleges? Sure, um, I've served on the board now 17 years. Um, I've been board chair, I've, been, I've had other uh, offices in, in the district. I currently am the uh, chairman of the Audit, Budget and Finance Committee, which has been a real interesting trip this year because of the COVID and other uh, uh, economic issues. 
Um, I was a founding chair of the uh, Texas Association, uh, Community College Association of Texas Trustees in the state of Texas. And uh, as you noted, I was also chair of AACT. I also serve on the board of AACC, which uh, is the American Association of Community Colleges, which is, represents the presidents, which kind of was an anomaly because I was the only trustee. Uh, I think, well, there's been maybe one more selected uh, other than myself to serve on that board. A real honor and a privilege, as it is a, a privilege to be associated with you, Dr. Sarata, and with uh, Dr. Hellier. Dr. Hellier and I have served on committees at the state level, and uh, she's amazing in terms of uh, the uh, uh, assets she brings to any discussion. The Alamo Colleges are five separately accredited colleges, which is an anomaly in Texas. There's only another system that's like that, and that's Dallas. So it, it brings a different uh, governance perspective. Uh, and so um, I, I, I'll share that with you later on, maybe in this presentation. But again, uh, uh, we have about uh, over 100,000 students, at least we did before the COVID uh, uh, pandemic hit. Uh, and we're, um, uh, again, uh, in Bear County in the state of Texas and uh, right in the middle of uh, the I-35 uh, corridor. Thank you so much, Mr. Zarate. And uh, let me let me uh, switch a little bit to the the purpose of this session specifically. Um, I'm going to start with Chancellor Hellier again. Can can you just de describe the ideal role from your perspective of the governing board and the relationship with you as the CEO and the college as a whole? So the ideal role is really, I think, one of respect and trust between the board members and the chancellor, um, the CEO. And, and I, I see that within our institution. Um, our institution, the board, um, again, seven members, and they are, are focused again on what's best for our students, our taxpayers and our community. And you see them focusing around that. They ask hard questions. Um, they don't allow the issues to come to the table that they're not willing to dig into and understand. And so that's the ideal role is having a board that's engaged, a board that respects your role as, as the CEO, but also a board that is focused on the priorities and the governance structure that's been put in place. And so for our board, um, they, they know that they approve the budget, they approve the tax rate, tuition and fees, they set policy and they um, set the strategic plan and they hire, evaluate, and fire the chancellor. And, and so they have bylaws that help govern that structure, but they also are very focused again on, on that student and making sure that they are asking the questions around that. And that makes for a really powerful relationship because as you look at how to strategically um, impact your community, you need that alignment between between your board and your CEO. And, and so that is really the ideal relationship and, and I've seen it in action. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Zarate, from your perspective as a board member, you've chaired the board, you've served on different committees of the board. Um, what do you see as the ideal relationship between the CEO and, and the board? You've got to have a cohesive plan. One of the things that I think has made us uh, an award-winning uh, uh, district is that um, we have had retreats where we deal with those priorities that Brenda's talking about, where we uh, uh, look at each other face to face and talk about what is the vision for the community and what is the vision for uh, the uh, the student body that we serve. Um, yes, we are. We have the, the fiscal responsibility, which is the budget. We do have the policy re uh, uh, responsibility, and which is the, the legal aspect actually in terms of governance. But we also have the student success agenda. And so those three areas have been incredibly important to us. And our priorities come from that. Not only that, but we translate that into uh, charges for the chancellor. So the chancellor understands what the board is expecting and what the vision is. If the chancellor doesn't know what the board wants uh, in terms of uh, their accountability to the community, then the chancellor is going to uh, basically uh, be handicapped or handcuffed in terms of uh, his act, his or her action. So again, if you have a plan, it's strategic, and it deals with those three aspects, and you stay within those aspects in terms of the uh, of not getting in the weeds, for example, 
I think uh, uh, it, any board and any chancellor or any president is going to be successful. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I'd like to, to get your thoughts on is um, how each of you worked with your CEO or board to establish your college's mission statement specifically and your strategic plan as a whole. And Chancellor Hellyer, I'm going to ask you to answer this from, from two perspectives. In addition to uh, being the CEO for the San Jacinto Community College District, you're also the chair of the Texas Association Community College. Uh, you serve on that board and you serve as the chair. So I'd ask you to answer it from, from both a member of the board of, of an organization, but also as a CEO that reports to a board. Okay. Well, you complicated that one a bit. So, um, <laughs> so let me start with, with the college perspective. So when I became chancellor in 2009, um, our board was focused on a student success agenda, but we hadn't gone through and really done a lot of strategic planning on what does that mean as we operationalize it? And so the board went through a retreat, just like Roberto said, and it was around our vision definition, our mission definition, our values, and really getting that defined first. And, and then also developing um, our, our strategic goals. And I don't think there was anything more powerful than to see the board circling the words around student success or economic mobility for our community and seeing how that came into the vision and the mission for the college and translated into our strategic plan. And then the charge that the board gave um, back to me and, and to my leadership team was, you guys figure out the strategies and how you, we need to operationalize this. And we took that back to the college community, shared data around where there were successes with our students and gaps with our students. <laughs> and uh, then ask the college community to help us define the strategies to make sure that we were achieving the strategic goals in that strategic plan. And so that was our first strategic planning process. And, and every year through that process, we had annual priorities that the entire institution was focused on of how we were going to move things forward with regular updates back to the board from a strategic planning standpoint um, from measuring the, what the key performance indicators were for, for our institution and being able to show where there were, were results. We've updated the vision and mission plan um, over this 10-year this period. Uh, again, board contributing to that, asking for college community to give us feedback uh, as we made revisions. We've updated our goals. But our strategic plan, that vision mission, is a very important alignment piece to making sure that we're all working on the same agenda. And from the Texas Association of Community Colleges, um, we, we try to take the same approach. Um, we, our biggest issue that we, we deal with is around the funding with the state legislative session. And, and so how do we make, put those priorities together how do we make sure we're getting the feedback from all of our 50 community college districts, but then also aligning with our trustee organization, um, the Texas Teachers and Faculty Association, and again, that alignment component of it, because we're much stronger together than, than separate. And so that's how we've really charged that, um, that work, and then coming back and reporting on where do we have gaps? Um, and so when you look at the Texas Association of Community Colleges, you see funding, you see transfer issues, you see workforce issues as, as our priorities. And again, trying to bring the entire state forward. Oh, thank you so much. It's an interesting perspective to see it both as a CEO reporting to the board and then to be on the board of an organization. I think that's a unique perspective. I certainly appreciate you sharing that. Mr. Zarate, how about you? Um, how have you worked with, with your CEOs? And you've worked with at least two or three CEOs during your time on the board at Alamo Colleges uh, with your colleagues on the board to establish Alamo College's mission statement uh, specifically and your strategic plan as a whole. Well, we, we've been, again, very forceful in terms of our uh, uh, need to, to uh, communicate. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, helped us tremendously is that we started attending the ACCT uh, uh, trustee uh, 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 
government institutes that uh, kind of got us in, turn, uh, in tune in terms of what our accountability was and what the responsibility was. And then when we came back, we knew that we had to have retreats to uh, foster that, that uh, conversation. And then we have a very robust com a committee uh, meeting structure. We meet a week before uh, each uh, meeting and we go through all of the committees from uh, legal to uh, student success. And we vet and discuss and get a lot of, uh, of uh, information from uh, the uh, chancellor and his staff. By same token, we get to answer quest ask questions about what is it uh, that, that's happening? What is our progress? And we do this on a, a monthly basis. It's not like you take uh, uh, this information and at the end of the year, you review it. We're going month by month by month so we can stay uh, in tune with the challenges we've given the chancellor. And, and I wanna make a point about this. The, cha the, uh, the challenges we gave the, the, the chancellor are very, mo uh, very much uh, in tune with what uh, the, the three areas of priority that I've, I've stated before. Um, and so there's an accountability feature there. We can hold the chancellor accountable, but in a positive way, in the sense that we can use all that information as we evaluate whether the chancellor is performing at the level that we expect. And so uh, again, uh, it's, it's a matter of communication and also being very frank and knowledgeable about what your community expects. Thank you so much. So we, we've talked a lot about positives and it's, it's so refreshing to see both institutions really focused on student success and ultimately on, on facilitating the success of the students that you serve. Uh, let's talk about the harder things. Um, and I'll start with you, Chancellor Hellier. Can you describe the role of the board in disciplinary and investigative matters at your institution? So the board doesn't have much of a role in those areas um, unless um, there's a disciplinary or termination issue that the employee wants to come to the uh, to the board as a basically as a, a citizen and then they would come and do it in that role. And through that then there could also be an avenue for them to meet with the board in executive session because we don't let any public comments about employee situations in front of, um, in the public setting. On the other side of it, um, if there is a concern, a grievance, a fraudulent activity concern about the chancellor, then that would all go to the board chair. And if it's, and, and so that investigation then would be taken at that level. And we have, a lot of avenues for employees to bring concerns forward um, from grievances, concerns, uh, appeals committees, but those are all really go through, um, up through the strategic leadership team and the chancellor, and then it would be a public comment to, to the board. There's also anonymous reporting that we have through an ethics point hotline. And again, that happens through internal audit and, and that is reported back to the board through our annual internal audit reporting to them. They also get um, regular um, internal audit updates through their finance committee, but the whole board gets the internal up audit update once a year, unless there's something that the finance committee would want them to bring forward. And, and again, in that situation, if there would be a complaint about the chancellor, then it would be managed through the board chair. If there's a complaint about the board chair, it would be managed by the vice chair or by legal, if, if that would be the, the next step of, of how it needed to be managed. And so I think the biggest thing is to have that defined in advance of, you know, of what the processes are. And we have been very clear in defining um, what processes need to be happening through the board, through their board, board bylaws, through policies, and, and then making sure that that's clear. So our constituents know that, our employees know it, our community know what the, the, the proper methods are. Thank you so much. Mr. Zadate, what would you like to add in describing the role of the board in disciplinary and investigative matters? Well, uh, Bill, let me give you a little bit of history first for Alamo. We've had a checkered past. I came on board when uh, the board was, about four of the board members were indicted for fraud and 
all kinds of things. So we were very sensitive about this. We have the ethics points, uh, ethics point uh, uh, application so that we can make sure that people will have access to uh, making complaints or whatever, and that's fine. We have a very strong legal department uh, that uh, will follow the investigations. In terms of the uh, disciplinary stuff, that's up to the chancellor and the presidents. That is in their bailiwick, and we should not get involved with that because if it's brought to us, we've got to be able to adjudicate and um, make some determination in terms of affirmation for the chancellor or the president's decisions or, or not. So that's important. Because of our checkered past, uh, we have an internal audit department, but that department uh, reports directly to the board. So, and, and that's a distinction that you need to be, uh, uh, that you need to understand. Uh, uh, most internal audit depart departments report to the uh, chancellor, and then it comes to the board. But in our case, all the reports come to us, and we have monthly reports from the uh, uh, the internal auditor. In fact, as the uh, chairman of the Audit Budget and Finance Committee, he reports directly to me. And so uh, as the reports are being finalized, um, we uh, uh, I, I have a chance to review and also present it to the board at the committee meetings. But I think what's even more important than anything else is that the internal audit department has an audit plan and it's based on audit uh, uh, standards. And those standards uh, need to be complied with. As we formulate that audit plan, all the board members have a chance to say, those are great priorities, proceed with those. And so if you wanna look at, for example, student enrollment or uh, uh, any kind of compliance issue that we have uh, responsibility for, the internal auditor then is directed to start looking at that and, and give us a report in terms of what our status is. And we have a consultative mo uh, um, model in that once uh, the auditor comes up with something, he needs to consult with the administration and work out things before they even come to the board and give us an idea of what has happened to not necessarily rectify the problem, but to enhance the problem, to make it better. No, thank you both so much. Um, I want to get to um, another question. So both of your colleges have been Aspen Prize finalists multiple times. So congratulations on that outstanding achievement. How has the relationship between the board and CEO at your colleges facilitated such student success and accolades at your respective institutions? Uh, Chancellor Hellyer, I'll start with you, please. So for us, again, I think it has been this alignment from the board throughout the entire organization. Our, our strategic plan, I know you hear a lot about strategic plans. Our strategic plan is a working document. It is being used daily and it, it starts with the board. It comes into our goals, but it's our annual priorities. And so all, co all the college employees are aligned around that. That has helped define what's important. And again, the first thing you'll see is the goal around student success. And, and so again, that alignment and, and defining what are the priorities and uniting your entire college community around that and talking about it and talking with your community about it, that this is important. And so I think it's that alignment and that focus on working together on, these are the priorities, sharing the data, um, Sharing the data that's good, the successes you're achieving, but where are your gaps? Where does this organization need to be working and looking at other ways to remove barriers for your students? And so it, it's sharing that good data and that bad data throughout the organization and th with, with the board. And so I think that uh, alignment piece, building a culture of continuous improvement and, and development, uh, making sure that we're all focused on, again, removing those barriers for our students. And, and so I see that as the, the success. Um, one of the things though, is that we are an institution that knows there's always the next step and the next step. And, and so while it, it's great getting that recognition from the Aspen, um, our board will be the first to tell you, um, we do this work around our student success agenda because it's the right things for our students. We can't afford to have gaps and have where students aren't succeeding and how do we, as San Jacinto College, remove them? And so it's, uh, again, it's, it's just um, everybody focused on the important thing of making sure our students are succeeding. 
Excellent. Mr. Zadate, how about from your perspective as a board member? It's leadership. Pure and simple. I mean, uh, we've, we've gotten the Ballridge Award, the first community college ever, I think, that's gotten that award. We have been up for the Aspen, but it, it's been a matter of leadership. And Brenda uh, and you, uh, Bill, are examples of what good leadership is, a great leadership is. I know that when Bruce Leslie was our chancellor and now Mike uh, Flores is our chancellor, we've worked at going from good to great. You never get to great. You constantly improve. And so as long as the board is, is educated in that respect, you're gonna succeed. Uh, and we also have, uh, again, like I said, that robust committee uh, structure that we have here in Alamo is that we're always looking for those uh, areas of, of strategic importance and, and trying to see how we can enhance and help and uh, make sure that we as a board can make good decisions, not only just to say, yay, you're doing a great job, but how do we support them with our budget, for example? How do we support them with our policy? Uh, an example with a strategic plan, our strategic plan is not just a document. As Brenda said, it's a working document, but it's in policy. And if you don't put it into policy, uh, you don't, some people don't take it seriously, but it's policy and it's codified. Everything that comes to us at the board in terms of our, our agenda items has got to have a reference to the strategic plan. And, and that justifies the expenditure. If it doesn't, then uh, we don't we don't consider it. But luckily, our our leadership does not bring us anything other than things that are tied into the strategic plan and that will enhance our our student success agenda. So let me ask my final question of each of you, uh, Mr. Zadat. I'm going to begin with you as a board member. Um, what advice would you have for a new board member that is coming on to one of the 50 community college boards in the state of Texas? You, you don't know everything. You don't have the context, really, other than the political context you use to get elected. You don't have the context. Community colleges uh, are not like the ISDs. They're not like the uh, boards of the uh, uh, Texas uh, uh, colleges. It's different. It's, um, to me, it's, it's, it's an institution or the institutions that are really uh, uh, very reflective of the democratic profile that we espouse to as Americans. We take in everybody, it, you know, it's open enrollment. We do everything we can to make sure the students that uh, are at risk or that had no other opportunities have that opportunity to succeed. So when you come in and you, and let's say you're just focused on uh, the fiscal aspects of the district and worried about the taxpayers and the tax rate uh, and, and that's all you're, you're, you're focused on. It's more comprehensive than that. And then you also have to look at your leadership. Um, where has that, that leadership taken you as, as a system? So for example, like Brenda, Brenda has been terrific in terms of her uh, uh, leadership and uh, taking her college, college system uh, forward in a very positive and imaginative, innovative way. Bill, in your case, uh, your colleges and you have made uh, some innovations that we're all copying. Uh, and so you need to look at that. And some uh, trustees don't have that context. They, uh, they, it takes a while to develop that. So my, my thing is, if you're a new trustee, I would immediately sign up for a GLI with ACCT so that you can get exposed to uh, what's happening nationally and statewide. And then sit back a little bit and start listening you know, the, I mean, in my case, for the first three months that I was a trustee, I had no idea what the heck was going on. And so as I listened and as I grew from that listening, uh, I became more effective. And I think that's the advice I would give any new trustee is listen first and then start working on how do you enhance the leadership of that system? Thank you so much, Mr. Zanathan. And I'll turn to you, Chancellor Hellyer. How would, uh, what advice would you give a new CEO as they're working with um, an elected board? That same thing, you've got to listen. Um, what has the institution been through? What, where are they trying to get? Listen for, to that board so that you really understand and then define what you're gonna do to help make, move, make sure you're moving that forward. And you're gonna find things that are good and things that aren't so good and be ready to share that you can't be afraid it's 
I think so many times CEOs are afraid to engage their board on the issues that you're really dealing with. And this has to be a team approach. And, and so listening, engaging, sharing, but don't jump to conclusions too quickly either. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of history, build on that history, but where do you wanna move for, for the future? And I agree with Roberto on what he said about a new trustee. Um, it's engaging, a CEO has to really work with the board chair and the rest of the board members to engage a new, C, a new board, new trustee. There is incredible work that's been done, a lot of history. And so how do you help that new board member see what, what's been done and what the next steps are and engage them around questions because you, you want them to understand the next steps and you want them to bring new ideas to the table. And, and so it is that listening and truly tackling this work together. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Zarate, for, for providing some really good context from a trustee's uh, viewpoint. Uh, Chancellor Hellyer, thank you so much for providing that same context from a CEO. And on behalf of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board in this leadership conference, I thank you both, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. <laughs>